on World News Tonight. Djokovic ejected. Nine-time Australian Open champion Novak Djokovic will not defend his 2021 title after Australia revokes his visa following an outcry over his controversial medical inception from the country's coronavirus vaccination rules. Fans outraged by the discussions underway. Tonight, the latest on that visa saga. Capital Riots Remembrance America braces for a memorial of the January 6th infamous attack on its capital as many supporters of the Trump movement rejecting it as hogwash by the Democrats. However, the Dems pushing to keep the memories alive, targeting midterms. The Omicron Effect India reports its first death from Omicron as the subcontinent struggles to control the spread of the new variant. Tonight, officials are doing their best to keep the virus at bay and not repeat a nationwide lockdown. And the first cover of white. The land of the rising sun now covered with a sheet of snow. This is Adha Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening. Thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. Tonight's broadcast begins with the twists and turns of Novak Djokovic's Australia visa mess. The world's top tennis star has been denied entry to Australia over his COVID-19 vaccination status, leading to his detention and removal in a dramatic reversal for the tennis world number one. Australian border force has called fault on the visa of the world's number one tennis star having previously been allowed a medical exemption for Melbourne's forthcoming Australian Open Novak Djokovic has been denied entry and his visa has been cancelled the requirements uh, were not able to be met uh, there was a an exemption uh, that had been provided through the Victorian government process clearly that did not pass uh, the standards of proof that were required by the Australian border force uh, yes it's tough but it's fair and it's equitable and it's one rule for all under this Australian government. The Victoria State Government mandated that only fully vaccinated players, staff, fans and officials could enter Melbourne Park when the tournament starts on January 17th. Vaccine exemptions can be permitted in the case of major medical conditions, serious adverse reaction to a previous COVID vaccine or evidence of recovery within the last six months. The tennis maestro has refused to share his vaccine status and his exemption prompted a huge backlash from a population that has been under lockdown more than most others, with many citizens abroad unable to return home since 2020. Prime Minister Scott Morrison has come under fire over Djokovic's exemption but insisted that nobody is above the rules. Djokovic plans to file an injunction to avoid being sent back. Over in the U.S., Donald Trump abruptly gave up his plan to steal his limelight on the anniversary of the January 6th assault against Congress, leaving President Joe Biden to address a divided nation. And U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland vowed to hold accountable anyone involved in last year's deadly capital attack by former president's supporters and said the Justice Department's work on the matter is far from done. January 6, 2021. Supporters of former U.S. President Donald Trump, falsely believing his re-election was stolen, assault the Capitol building. One year on, America is still dealing with the fallout of that deadly day. A special congressional committee of seven Democrats and two Republicans has been investigating what led to the attack, how to prevent another, and how much responsibility Trump bears. And we fight. We fight like hell, and if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. The committee has interviewed hundreds of witnesses and is trying to get access to Donald Trump's official records related to the day, documents Trump has tried to block. This winter, it plans to begin weeks of public hearings that will put the deadly riots in the spotlight once again. Five people were killed in the riots, including one Capitol Police officer, and around 140 officers were assaulted. Capitol Police have been criticized for not taking warnings about the riots seriously and not responding more forcefully. The U.S. Capitol Police chief says there are no concerning protests scheduled for the anniversary and that significant work has been done over the past year. The United States Capitol Police uh, as an organization is stronger and better prepared to carry out its mission today um, than it was before January 6th of last year. 
Those who participated in the assault are also still facing justice. More than 700 people have already been charged and authorities continue to make arrests. Those convicted have received sentences including fines, probation and for some, prison time. French President Emmanuel Macron has been accused of using divisive, vulgar language after he used a slang term to say he wanted to make life difficult for unvaccinated people. For more on this, we have other there in the World News special correspondent Chetana Damaratna reporting from Normandy in France. Chetana? Yes, Senator Ali. Three months ahead of presidential election, opponents of President Macron said his words were unworthy of a president. PM's halted debate on a law bearing the unvaccinated from much of public life. The session in the National Assembly was brought to a standstill for a second night running as opposition delegates complained about the president's language, with one leading figure describing it as unworthy, irresponsible and premediated. The legalization is expected to be approved in a vote this week, but it has angered vaccine opponents and several French PMs have said they had received death threats over the issue. On the other hand, France's Senate has anonymously passed a resolution calling for France to support the adoption of the end of war declaration on the Korean Peninsula. France's foreign minister described it as a great initiative. The resolution calls for Paris to endure countries' efforts to establish lasting peace and the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Back to you, Anurag. Thank you. That was Adha Dhanu World News Special Correspondent Chetan Dharmaratna from Normandy in France. Now, regarding the latest missile launch in North Korea, the U.S. has condemned the move, calling it a violation of UNSC resolutions and urged the regime to return to dialogue. China called for diplomacy, while Japan slammed the North, saying it posted a grave threat to the country. The United States has condemned Pyongyang's latest missile launch, calling it a violation of multiple U.N. Security Council resolutions, as well as a threat to the international community. These remarks coming shortly after North Korea on Wednesday fired a missile into the East Sea, according to South Korea's Minister of Defense and the Pentagon. A spokesperson at the U.S. State Department said Washington is consulting closely with its allies and partners in the region. Stressing the U.S. remains committed to a diplomatic approach to the North, the spokesperson called on the regime to engage in dialogue. Responding to the launch, China also pressed for the resumption of talks. Under the current situation, all parties concerned should keep in mind the big picture, be cautious with their words and actions, adhere to the right direction of dialogue and consultation, and work together to advance the political settlement on the peninsula issue. Beijing emphasized that exchanges and cooperation between countries would promote mutual understanding and trust rather than targeting or undermining the interests of third parties. Japan condemned the North, saying the regime's missile tests pose a grave threat. We find it truly regrettable that North Korea has continued to fire missiles from last year. The government wants to strengthen its vigilance and surveillance more than ever. We are now conducting a detailed and urgent analysis. Citing experts, the AP said the North's launch, the first of its kind since October, signals it's not interested in rejoining denuclearization talks anytime soon. Rather, they say it shows the regime is focused on pushing ahead with its military buildup. Peacekeepers from a Russian-led alliance of ex-Soviet states will be sent to Kazakhstan to help stabilize the country after President Kasim Jomar Tokayev appealed for help, quelling protests that he said were being led by terrorists. The Central Asian country has been rocked by protests since the start of the year over a hike in fuel prices. Kazakhstan's violent protests spiral even further out of control as thousands take to the streets, furious over rising fuel prices and government corruption. Armed protesters storming the city hall in the commercial capital of Almaty, appearing to set parts of the building on fire. Protesters even raiding the city's airport, forcing staff to flee. Riot police using flashbangs to disperse crowds gathered outside the mayor's office aiming water cannons at protesters in the city center. President Kasim Jomar Tokayev taking sweeping actions in an attempt to ease tensions, removing the prime minister and his entire cabinet from office and reinstituting price caps on fuel. He even blocked the internet for most of the country. But none of that was enough to quell the unrest. 
Instead, a fourth straight night of violence. Charred police vehicles lining the streets, more than 200 people detained in the protests, at least 95 police officers injured. Demonstrators first took to the streets over the weekend, angered over rising prices for liquid petroleum gas in this oil-rich nation. They've since morphed into a broader expression of anger at the government, economic inequality, and perceived corruption among the ruling elites. This oil worker calling for the president and his predecessor, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, to step down. Many believe Nazarbayev, a Communist Party leader who ruled the former Soviet state for three decades until 2019, still wields great influence behind the scenes. In a tweet, Kazakhstan's president blamed destructive persons interested in undermining the stability and unity of our society. But after so many years of autocratic rule, there are almost no opposition politicians capable of rallying nationwide support, leaving an unclear endgame for these leaderless demonstrations. Welcome back to World News Tonight. At least six workers at a dyeing and printing mill in India were killed and around 20 were taken to hospital after inhaling toxic gas caused by an illegal dump of waste chemicals. Furthermore, India has recorded its first Omicron-related death. Let's cross over to Abhi the World News Special Correspondent Gayathri Gunasekhar reporting from Delhi in India for more. Gayathri? Yes, Anuradhi. A 74-year-old man who died in the western state of Rajasthan was India's first death from the Omicron variant. Officials said the man had been suffering from diabetes and other comorbid conditions. India has reported nearly 3,000 Omicron cases so far. It reported more than 90,000 cases today, a nearly six-fold rise in the over past week that experts say is fueled by the Omicron variant. India recorded 325 deaths in the past 24 hours, but only one has been linked to Omicron. Meanwhile, India has not added COVID-19 pill to its national treatment protocol for the disease due to known safety concerns that have restricted its use elsewhere. Merck and Indian drug maker Dr. Reddy's Laboratories Limited, which plans to launch a generic version of the pill early next week, did not immediately respond to requests for comment. Back to you, Anradi. Thank you. That was other than the World News Special Correspondent Gayathri Gunasekhar from Delhi in India. In the United States, the CDC has announced booster shots for children aged 12 to 15, which is welcome news, but at the same time, the CDC also faces backlash with some of its other recommendations. All this has been causing massive disruptions of the nation's schools. A domino effect takes over on teachers, parents and students as Omicron spreads and testing falls short. With the Omicron variant igniting a record-setting surge of COVID-19, school administrators are grappling over how and whether to keep classrooms open. In Chicago, officials canceled classes after the teachers voted to return to remote learning and pushed for better safety protocols, citing concerns over the highly contagious Omicron variant. The teachers have called for in-school COVID testing and mandatory vaccinations. Cities including Milwaukee, Atlanta and Detroit this week either implemented online instruction or delayed returns to school due to staff shortages and Omicron concerns. Though most public school districts nationwide opted to stay open, like in New York City, a relief for some parents eager to keep kids in class. The rolling seven-day average number of new COVID cases in the United States hit 540,000. The country shattered global records for a single day with nearly one million new infections on Monday. But despite the staggering numbers, the Biden administration and health officials are urging schools to keep their doors open. White House COVID-19 response coordinator Jeff Zients said the federal government has provided funding for better ventilation and testing and that widespread vaccinations make schools safe. So we have the tools. We know how to keep our kids safe in school. About 96 percent of schools are open. Parents want schools open. And experts are clear that in-person learning is best for kids' physical and mental health and for their education. Meanwhile, public health officials have warned that the sheer volume of Omicron cases threatens to overwhelm hospitals, some of which are already struggling to handle COVID-19 patients, primarily the unvaccinated.
Police have rescued a hospital boss and his two deputies after anti-vaccination protesters laid siege to their office in the French overseas territory of Guadeloupe. These unvaccinated health workers at the University Hospital in Pointe Pitre in Guadeloupe picketed to demand reinstatement and payments of lost wages after being suspended. Tension mounted and the hospital director and his deputy had to be escorted to safety by police in what turned out to be a violent standoff. The protesters said the responsibility lay with hospital management for refusing to engage in dialogue about their demands. They feel they are being attacked. The hospital director has made an official complaint. The government says it will prosecute those responsible for the attack. They declared a state of health emergency for Guadeloupe and several other overseas territories, citing a considerable rise in virus cases due to the fast spread of the Omicron variant. Australia and Japan signed a treaty to beef up defence and security cooperation at a virtual summit today. In the latest move to strengthen ties amid China's rising military power and economic clout in the Indo-Pacific region. The two leaders signed a reciprocal access agreement. Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison had said it will, for the first time, set out a framework for the two countries' defence forces to cooperate with each other. The strengthened security ties expand on efforts by the United States, Japan, India and Australia, dubbed the Quad, to work on shared concerns about China, including its pressure on Taiwan, trade disputes and freedom of navigation in the region. China responded by saying that bilateral treaties should promote regional trust and peace and stability. We have some good news for you. South Korea's Environment Ministry has decided to limit the use of disposable items again. Starting April, single-use plastic cups will not be allowed at cafes and from November, paper cups and plastic straws will be banned at restaurants. Single-use plastic cups will be banned from cafes starting this April. The Environment Ministry has announced a set of laws to limit the use of plastic and other disposable items. Under the revised rules, coffee shops cannot use plastic cups, plates or cutlery from April 1st. And from November 24th, paper cups and plastic straws will be banned at restaurants and cafeterias. Convenience stores and bakeries will also no longer be able to give customers plastic bags. Stores that violate the measure could face fines of up to 2,500 U.S. dollars. The ministry says the measures are aimed at reducing soaring waste amid the pandemic. In 2020, the amount of plastic waste dropped 19 percent, while paper surged 25 percent. Expanded polystyrene, such as styrofoam, increased 14 percent and plastic wrapping and plastic bags climbed 9 percent. The Environment Ministry called on the public and relevant industries for their support to reduce disposable items. The government had initially prohibited the use of plastics in August 2018, but temporarily granted its use in light of the COVID-19 outbreak. This has allowed cafes and restaurants to use disposable items in line with the government's efforts to prevent virus transmissions. But now with vaccine rollouts, the ministry has decided to prohibit single-use plastics again to reduce waste. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. This year's Grammy Award ceremony honoring top performances in music has been postponed indefinitely because of the rapid spread of the Omicron variant of the coronavirus. This music awards show was set to be held on January 31st. Italy made COVID-19 vaccination mandatory for people from the age of 50, one of very few European countries to take similar steps in an attempt to ease pressure on its health service and reduce fatalities. Fueled by the highly transmissible Omicron variant, Australia's daily coronavirus infection soared to a fresh peak as the country recorded a record amount of booster shots. Samsung presented innovative gadgets in line with its focus areas this year, including sustainability. Samsung is also rolling out even more customization options for its bespoke lineup of home appliances. The past year has proved to be yet another incredibly difficult one for airlines as the slump in air travel continued throughout 2021 due to the impact of the ongoing pandemic. Air New Zealand has topped an annual list of the safest airlines in the world for 2022 as coronavirus disease continues to dominate the conversation around air safety.
as China has been accused of slavery and genocide against the Uyghur minority group in the resource-rich western region of the country, electric car maker Tesla opened a showroom in China's controversial Xinjiang region, making it the latest foreign firm caught up in tensions related to the far western Chinese region. U.S. rights and trade groups have criticized Tesla for opening a showroom in China's Xinjiang. It comes after the electric car maker announced the opening on its official Weibo account on Friday. The region in China's west has been a key source of tension in recent years. UN experts estimate more than one million people have been detained there. They are mainly thought to be Uyghurs and members of other Muslim minorities. China has rejected accusations of forced labor or any other abuses. Authorities claim the camps provide vocational training and that companies should respect its policies there. On Tuesday, the Council on American-Islamic Relations criticized Tesla's move and said CEO Elon Musk must close the showroom. Another major U.S. trade group and Senator Marco Rubio have also condemned the opening. Tesla did not immediately respond to a request for comment. A number of foreign firms have struggled to balance tensions between the West and China over Xinjiang. Swedish fashion retailer H&M saw a 23% drop in local sales in China from March to May last year. That after it was hit by a consumer boycott for stating it did not source products from Xinjiang. Intel also saw similar problems after it told suppliers not to source labor or products from the region. The US chipmaker later apologized for trouble caused to Chinese customers and partners. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you have missed any of the stories we aired tonight, you can rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. Tokyo embraced its first snow of the year, brought by a low-pressure system emerging in the area. We're leaving you tonight with how the nation looks like with the first fall. Thank you for joining us. Good night.